From my games, I can clearly remember I learned how hard I could work without dying. Hi, my name is Anita de France. I'm currently first vice president of the International Olympic Committee, and I'm a proud bronze medalist in the sport of rowing. Today, I'll be breaking down clips about the Olympic Games in film. Cool running. Cool. This scene is from Cool Runnings. Cool Runnings is a Disney movie and is made for an audience of people who like to believe stuff that could be fun. There was no one key coach, as the movie suggests, and he certainly wasn't a, a white dude. And then the movie suggests that they got some r random track athletes. Well, no. The athletes were track athletes, but they were recruited from the Army, and they were used to following orders, not just goofing around and being stupid, as the movie unfortunately sometimes portrays them. And in some of the scenes, they even have athletes mocking them, which would not happen, certainly not in the open. I want to know why you disqualified my guys. As you were told, your team must compete in the international race in order to qualify for the Olympics. But in an Olympic year, the qualifiers count as an international race. Yes, in order to make sure that everyone is qualified, you have to go to qualifying events and make a standard. This is a single sport question. Did the team qualify or not? And it should be an easy question to answer. That may have been true in past Olympic years, but this year the Alliance decided to change its policy. Oh, please change its policy. The Alliance has the right to do whatever they feel is in there best interest of the sport. The Alliance is a multi-sport group and it would not change the policies of qualification within a sport, so that's just ridiculous. It's up to the sport to make decisions within its sport. Sorry if I interrupted your meeting. As for when they flipped, Too much, and I don't think he's going to be able to hold it. Oh! That was horrific. It was the most frightening thing that I believe I've seen on a track because you just don't know. Those sleds are heavy. Part of the training for a bobsled is to get your neck strong enough because it has to be able to stay straight as possible with all the G-forces. So what happens when you're riding on your head? So that was absolutely frightening. It's not true that they got out and carried the sled back. The sled was dragged, but they walked behind it. There was applause. There wasn't, you know, like a standing ovation because there was respect for the fact that they had done something really frightening and survived and were still proud to be a part of a team. And by the way, at the next games, their sled beat the U.S. sled. So, you know, they had to come back. This next clip is from Unbroken. Spikes on shoes have been a part of making sure that you have a good place to push off each time you stride because the tracks back then were a hard gravel pressed down, so it wasn't a, a solid surface. So having the cleats helped make sure that when you put your foot down and you're pushing off for your next stride, you won't slip. That symbol is called the Esteshuan, which is a very strange word, and it should say USA, not the Olympic rings, because it's the U.S. team. If you see something with the rings alone, that means it is something from the IOC itself. The positions look like they were done for a camera. For a 5K, you would not be in a kneeling position because it's not a sprint. But this is just everybody so clean, clean shaven, and all their uniforms are pristine. This is not like any start that I've seen. <laughs> recently. Uh, tick. I think that might be a silencer because one of the downsides of being a starter, at least back when guns were being used, is a lot of the starters would have hearing problems. A 5k run has a lot of tactical moves within it. Runners have to decide where they're going to be at which part of the race, where they're going to be most comfortable. You could see that some people were coming from what seemed further away to get over to lanes one and two. What most athletes want to do is get to a place where they can be comfortable, where they won't get stepped on or hit with someone else's elbow because stuff happens in these races. And we start the last lap. The things seem to be in control. Anybody who's running more than one lap at a track meet wants to know when the last lap will be. The bell rings to alert the people that this is their final lap, their final time around, because it could get very confusing. And some people have 
overrun or underrun the distance. So the bell is the most welcome sound, I think, for distance track athletes. It's high school kid Zane Perini pushing past the record breakers on this field. It's hard to know when a record setting run will happen. Nowadays they're very technical and you have to make sure that the wind is not aiding you too much and so forth. So it's more than just uh, foot speed across a certain distance. That record's going to hold for a while, let me tell you. This scene is from Blades of Glory. 5.9. I don't know where they are. This is not the kiss and cry corner. Jazz Michael Michaels has come in here and captivated this arena like a stack of classic Euro porn. There's a real gold medalist commentating in the scene. Scott Hamilton was one of the two commentators there. We have a tie. Yes. From the United States. Jimmy McElroy yes. and Charles Michael Michaels. Boy, Jimmy. It is highly unusual, but from time to time, double gold medals have been awarded. It's typically not because there was a tie. It has to do with some other intervening facts, generally speaking. This has to be a proud moment for Michaels and McElroy. Yeah. The look of the games is bizarre. Since 1984, every Olympic Games should have a look so that when you see the games, you know exactly what city it is and what year it is. I cannot tell what that look is, so I may not comment further, but that's some pretty bad look of the games. <laughs> now there's some jostling atop the podium and down goes Chaz Michael Michaels. McElroy still waving the crowd. Oh! I don't believe that a fight has ever been started on a podium. There would probably be a hearing as to what happened. The medal could be taken away. The podium doesn't belong to one person. It doesn't belong to one games. The podium is where the athletes who have managed to succeed to be the best in the world own that briefly, and then they release it for the next set of athletes to use it. So it doesn't belong to anybody. A perfect headbutt! This one is really stupid is all I have to say. <laughs> this clip is from Eddie the Eagle. Pierce, it's not theft. It's a lost and found, man. Come on, some guy dropped 10 bucks on the street and you were to pick it up, would that be theft? Yes. Where do I start? The current coach would not be having his athletes steal from other athletes, that's just plain absurd. The other problem is the coach. He's gigantic. Most ski jumpers are very petite, less to go flying through the air. So the notion that he was ever a ski jumper is just ridiculous. I think that what we saw is sort of the cartoon version of how to become a ski jumper, what you would do if you were making it up. I mean, if you were jumping over hurdles, you would want to make sure those hurdles were somewhat firm until you progressed to the point that you weren't going to kick them off then you would want them to be immediately destructible because that meant that you made a mistake. So this is something that I think a child would make up. A lot of times athletes don't have what they need. For example, in the ancient days of the early 70s when I was training, we didn't have barbells. So we would fill the cans with concrete, put them on a bar, and suddenly we had a barbell made of concrete tin cans. So yeah, there's all sorts of makeshift things. It's a practice jump. You don't need paperwork for a practice jump. The suit is designed to be aerodynamic. It meets the requirements of the Federation. You can't do something tricky like add a wing or a motor or something <laughs> along the line. But it also has a protective ability so that should you come back down to Earth, which is what gravity wants you to do, you'll be perhaps less beaten up than you would in just regular street clothes. We call them marshmallow suits. By we, I mean those who are not ski jumpers. <laughs> well, it looked like a baby jump. That was someone who does know how to ski jump. Now, it didn't mean that they were an elite level, but they kept the skis level pretty much the same distance apart throughout the jump and fell backwards a little bit. The telemark landing, which is considered the best way to land. This next clip is from the movie Race. Mr. Owens, I'm expecting great things. Anything less than a goal, we will consider a disappointment. I'm sure he's joking. Thanks, Coach. You'll let him. First of all, being accosted by a member of the, I take it it was the U.S. Olympic Committee, in those blazers with the Estesio on with still 
the rings, not USA on it. That's just not the way stuff happens. Now, I've said that recognizing that Mr. Owens had a different skin tone than the other members of his team. At the Olympic Village, everybody was equal. There's no way that Mr. Owens would be randomly walking around the stadium alone like that. That just does not happen. Well, there's a very specific way that you come out, a specific time, and there'll be a, a specific lapse of time between your warm-up getting there and then your actual competition. And you certainly wouldn't have number tag on the outside of the sweatshirt. Then and now, the International Olympic Committee selects a city six and now seven years in advance. A lot can happen in a country in six or seven years. So when Berlin was selected, there was no Hitler. It was just the beginning of the party starting to rise. So that is not correct. Although I did think that was a really nice bag that he had, and we never got stuff as nice as that bag was. This is 1936 again, and they don't have those clip-on starting blocks that are so well-known nowadays. So they were creating their own starting block by digging out a little hole that they could have something to push against as they start so that their power can be directed forward. Typically, the head is down until the set, and then they come up. At the 36 games, they were doing lots of innovative things. For example, for the first time, they had closed circuit television. So if you were on the circuit, you could watch the games on television for the first time in the history of the Olympic Games. This clip is from Olympic Dreams. A bunch of guys in my building are having a party tonight. Um, I don't know if that interests you, but I, I was sent out to bring back cute girls, so. The Olympic Village is the home for the athletes for the time of their stay at the games. You have a place to eat, and then there are social areas. Parties are something different because, again, you have to respect the athletes who have not yet competed. And if you're about to compete, either you're really not serious about it or you wouldn't be having a party unless it was just to have food and healthy drinks. How's it going? It's good. Are you done competing? I have one more event. I'm very proud to say that when I came to Los Angeles to work for the organizing committee, I put together the things that you needed to have inside the village. And it's pretty much stayed the same over the years since the 84 villages. And among them were, of course, a beauty salon or a haircutting barber place. It's kind of a self-sufficient town. I fell on my first run, was just like a little shooken up, and then thankfully put it down on my second run. I'm trying not to laugh too much, but that's absolutely not realistic. Athletes are friendly with one another. You know that this is a special time in your life, but I seriously doubt that I'd be talking about a competition where I'd failed unless I knew the athlete and the athlete would appreciate what I was talking about. This was far too lightweight a discussion. Olympians are not casual. They're very serious about what they're doing at the games. Now we're at one of the Olympic villages for the Olympic Winter Games of 2018 in Pyeongchang, Korea. Teams have taken to putting flags up, showing that you're here and you're proud and this is where you live. For a very long time, the U.S. never put flags up. Result, everyone knew where the U.S. team was. It was the only building <laughs> that had no flags on it. This next scene is from Without Limits. 14 qualifiers, 13 on the starting line. Mariana Haro of Spain has withdrawn. Withdrawals from a race could mean any of a number of things. It could mean that someone was ill. It could mean that someone tripped. It could mean that someone was about to have a drug test that they could not pass. So I, I give sympathy because, and this is a very important thing to know, you are not an Olympian unless and until you compete at the Olympic Games. 5,000 meters, 12 and a half laps for the gold medal. The gun is up. Well, I probably shouldn't marvel at this so much, but these are the least sweaty athletes I've ever seen in my life. They're not doing the curve very well. It should look more like a semicircle. It looks like it's almost directly across. Often athletes create their tactics so that they spend the least possible time in the pack. 
They want either to be trailing it or out in front. It's really close in there, and at the moment, they're competing. They're not buddies. They're each one out to better the other, so they'll do what's necessary at the time. Oh. And this is surely being left. That was just the normal jostling. If someone had grabbed both shoulders and stopped them, that would be something different, but that's just, you know, the natural, unfortunately, flow of things. It's unusual that a hand was used because that's too much energy. You're messing up your stride, too, to raise your hand, so I doubt that that would happen. From the beginning, I tried to change him. And from the beginning, he tried not to change. One of the important things about Pre, as he was called, he was a special character, and he wanted to run the way he wanted to run. Sometimes coaches tell you, you know, you're too upright. Well, Jesse Owens was one of the most upright runners ever and was extraordinarily successful. So as a coach, your highest duty is to do no harm. Don't try to undo something that's working. This next scene is from I, Tanya. Well, the scene was making me laugh because all the people looking so concerned in the hallway and doing nothing but looking concerned. If the athlete needed help, someone should be helping the athlete prepare. We just finished. Okay. 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 Tanya Harding, after the warm-up, had a problem with her laces. If she's not out here, I think they're going to disqualify her. I'm not sure. As for the uh, broken shoestring, man, if you don't have your equipment right, what are you doing? There was a whole lot going on, clearly, in her life, but making sure that your equipment works is the first thing you do when you wake up. So it's kind of hard to understand how that happened. How long do we have? We have uh, one minute. A minute? Oh, my God. The Olympic Games have a time certain. Each competition is supposed to happen at a time certain. So if someone fails to appear at that time certain, you're no longer in the event. My lace broke. <laughs> I really tried to get out of here on time. Please. The duty of a sports administrator is to make sure that the competition is safe and fair. If the skate was not properly supporting her, it would not have been safe. My hope as you watch the athletes in the Olympic Games that you'll see the emotion, you'll see the excellence, you will be inspired by what they are presenting to the world. It's a very special thing and in this time of a pandemic having the world come together is more important than ever. Thank you so much for watching and thank you for having me Vanity Fair. <laughs>